was uh, our uh, very uh, friendly linguist and known to all of us, Professor Shailendra Mohan has joined as the CIL director and we are extremely happy about that. Um, so welcome to Shailendra and uh, it's so it's uh, I, I, I just I have to make an effort to be formal. I know that Uma insists that this should be a formal occasion, but this is like coming home and sitting among friends and acquaintances and students and that is the best an academic can hope for. So I'm very glad to be talking here. I might run out of time, but if you get the gist of the talk, I'll be um, satisfied. Okay, let me start. I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, which I need because it's a more of a general talk and there are some maps and things like that. Okay, so as Pankaj said, stories of agreement, and I'll try to um, keep track of the stories. I have put them in my slide so that I can uh, keep track of the stories. Um, and this is, I begin with the mainstream story, and this might be the uh, most difficult part for uh, many, of, uh, many of the audience, many in the audience who are not introduced to um, theories at various institutes. So I have made it as simple as possible. And let me see if I can get across to you. There are three parts. And the first part is really what? So what is agreement? Um, it's a kind of a formal representation. Agreement is a kind of a formal represent representation that shows uh, a relation um, between certain words, OK? Um, so let's take uh, this. Um, uh, points about agreement first into consideration that it is uh, a quintessentially syntactic phenomena because of what I said just a second ago that it is a relation. So it is not a purely morphological property. It is captured by morphology, but because it shows the relation between more than one word, it is a syntactic uh, a relation. So it expresses a relation that cannot be otherwise expressed in the morphology of the language. For example, these two examples here, Rani likes momos. I'm taking English example because these are the most uh, familiar and easier, as you see as I progress through the talk, that this phenomenon of agreement becomes more and more complicated. Um, then the second example, Rani warmed the food. And these two affixes, the morphological affixes, uh, however, you know, indicate uh, various things. And uh, in a way, we can straight away uh, land into things which are not visible on the surface. So I've written this word visible, invisible, categories of tense and uh, agreement, AGR, short form for agreement, that combine with the verb to give you agreement. So for example, in this first example, in English, it's uh, good because you can um, negate a sentence and you can see that the uh, the z, the morpheme, uh, the phoneme z has uh, shifted from its uh, position to um, an, another position. So it is still related to the verb like, but it has shifted as you can see in the blue color. Uh, for warmed, uh, so for the second sentence, I turned it into a yes, no question. And again, you can see the same phenomena where uh, from warm, which is the verb, the morpheme, so-called so agreement morpheme, has actually shifted to another position. Okay, so this uh, agreement therefore contains a stem, consists of a stem and an affix, and they're together on surface, but they represent different grammatical categories, and they're not together in syntax. Okay, so this is a point that you have to make a switch to understand that these are uh, in our speech, in our um, language, they appear on surface uh, together. But uh, if you look at the uh, structure, uh, there is plenty of evidence to show that they are not together, they're separated. Okay, so that's a simple thing. Now, the second issue about agreement is how is this? Now that we've introduced some two aspects at least, that uh, there is this agreement morphemes, and however, they are related to visible, invisible elements. So how are this, uh, how is this agreement established? 
So here I bring in a brief history of the clause structure, very brief, and I'll give you only a um, glimpse of the story, uh, the mainstream story. Uh, so roughly this is the following is the structure. And uh, if you have encountered any kind of tree structure, you would have seen probably a slightly sim simpler version of this, that you have a subject, you have a verb and an object. I've taken an SVO language for ease of uh, comprehension here. Um, but there is another empty space here, and that is the uh, invisible category that we talked about, which shows up in both those examples that we saw in the earlier slide, in the form of present tense in the first one, uh, and in the second one, in the form of the ud or the de uh, in the question form, de and ud in the base form. Um, however, the difference between the first and the second sentence, the first sentence, Rani likes momos, is that the z there captures not only present tense, but also captures number and person information, whereas the ud or de sort of eats up, quote unquote, eats up the number person information and only expresses the uh, tense element. So tense is one of our invisible categories that um, we must uh, take into consideration. So this is the first invisible category. Now, um, uh, how, does the, uh, how does agreement appear? So, so far we've seen tense is the invisible category responsible for this. Um, for various reasons, agreement was thought to deserve a place in this diagram. And a new head called AGR found a place in the tree in its own right. So this is the appearance of the uh, second, you can say, invisible category. So first we have T already now in our base structure. Now there's a new category, which is AGR. That's the appearance of a AGR slot. Now, um, uh, immediately, some of you might wonder, uh, that's all right for a language like English, but there are languages that we speak where there is agreement not only with the subject, but also sometimes with the object, okay? For some people, it is sometimes, for some people in the audience, it's most of the times, and that uh, there hangs a crucial tale that I will talk about um, uh, very briefly, I mean, very soon, uh, in detail, not briefly, okay? So this appearance of the second uh, agreement uh, slot actually uh, happened, but that was, uh, uh, I could say, is the contribution of, uh, well, um, at least a strong reason for this appearance is the contribution of South Asian um, linguists um, uh, participating in this research and bringing their own data and then forcing sort of a change in the uh, structure. So now we have two AGR slots. The second, the lower one is responsible for object agreement and the higher one is responsible for subject agreement. And this kind of changed the way that you do agreement. When I say do agreement, I mean how you compute agreement. The computation that we you do in syntax is claimed to be the kind, it's a reflection of the computation that you are doing while parsing the sentence in your head, whether it is after listening to it or before generating it, you still are engaged in parsing it. And the computation or the calculation of these two agreements is done in a manner which is uh, what the syntactician among us is supposed to be capturing. Okay, so this is a, a brief uh, a sort of story of how agreement can be established through two invisible categories like tense and AGR. And this obviously takes into consideration the underlying structure. Now these two agreement slots are distinguished by these two subscripts, S for subject, O for object. Um, now there is a bit of a, a side story and I call this slide the politics of the history. This history was a very narrow, restricted, uh, in a narrow restricted sense, a history of part of syntax, because we are only looking at agreement today. And these are stories about agreement. And I want to tell you the main story as um, uh, comprehensively as possible. So I thought of bringing in this, um, um, this um, part of the presentation, which will also justify my background and you'll see very soon in the next slide. So the politics of history is that the second agreement slot was partly, as I said, the contribution of researchers from South Asia 
especially uh, Anup Mahajan's thesis, uh, one of my seniors in the University of Delhi when I was a student um, and a former student of actually Professor Subarao, uh, or when he did a PhD in 1991 from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, which changed the future of, uh, development of syntax of uh, agreement. And um, just to elaborate further on this, um, you know, cutting a long story short, if we take a look at uh, a small sample of only about 378 uh, languages um, that uh, the walls map that I think most of you are familiar with um, is uh, constructed out of um, where, you know, person marking on the verb is depicted. Um, we find that in fact, we find this um, type of languages if you look at, so this is person marking in the, in the according to the walls map. And as you said, it's, a, it's a, not a big sample, but it is a substantial sample for us because there is nothing better which uh, exists, I believe. So this uh, map, which is there in my background, I hope it's still there. Um, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the first look that you can see is that the yellow spots dominate. And I don't know if you can read it, but yellow spots indicate both the uh, let's say just to simplify, we, we'll talk about subject and object, although they're not similar. Uh, this is uh, A and P arguments, but we'll, we'll uh, pretend that these are subject and object in most cases. So subject and object, both agreement of both the elements, subject and object seems to be the case. Even in this sample of 378 languages, you see that most languages actually show both agreements. So now you can imagine the importance of the uh, importance of the second agreement slot. So this both agreement slot, AGRS and AGRO together are kind of important. But uh, the politics is that if you look at at least the syntactic history of agreement, if you follow the literature from the 60s onwards, you will find this, uh, that tiny little corner of uh, uh, the world in Europe, you know, Northern Western Europe, uh, are the languages which have dominated studies in syntax um, and also other sub-disciplines for uh, several decades, um, giving a kind of shape to the theory that cannot be undone unless you reimagine, you know, the reimagine the beginning of the syntactic studies. So suppose the syntactic studies really started uh, syntactic studies on agreement really started from looking at a language like, let's say, uh, uh, Bantua, you know, Pankaj mentioned that we're looking at Bantua as well is a language spoken in Sikkim and in Eastern Nepal and or Mara, which is spoken in Mizoram. And there are several such languages or uh, let's say Santali, or if we start our agreement study from Maithili, then we are going to get a different theoretical shape of agreement. So that is uh, uh, the politics behind it. Uh, it cannot be undone, but we can understand it better and we can open it out to the world that, you know, there is more than that little corner of the world where you find a uh, different kind of agreement phenomena. As you can see, those little corner of the world has red spots. That is the subject only agreement, which is which we saw in our examples from English. So these yellow spots indicate agreement with multiple arguments, okay? So now I've finished the what and the how uh, and the little politics. Now, this is the important part, which is there in my abstract also, which is when, you know, the question of timing. It's not a historical timing. So I would like to qualify this timing, this temporal temporality that I'm talking about is not the historical progression, which also I'll talk about in plenty in this talk, but actually I'm talking about um, timing within the computation. Remember I talked about computations that we sort of uh, assume and then we build a theory around that. And we also assume that this is similar or reflective of the kind of computation that is going on in your head as well when you parse the sentence. So I'm talking about timing there. And this is a glimpse of the assumption that we have uh, for this kind of um, theory. As you can see, as you will see, I think, uh, when you look at the timing of the components, 
you'll see that you know there is this um, so-called on the right hand side the inverted y diagram which might be familiar to many people you might have different uh, labels or tags at the end of the arrows you might have like d structure going to s structure going to sound and meaning so in the early part of the 20th century itself it was uh, very much in discussion that there is uh, there are underlying representations and their surface representations and there are two aspects sound and meaning uh, including uh, you know um, uh, early uh, structural linguist uh, uh, like uh, <clears throat> everybody knows the name uh, Saussure uh, also talked about this. This is not really Saussurean sound and meaning because meaning here is uh, abbreviated as logical form. That's not all of meaning. And um, the sound part is abbreviated as phonetic form. Uh, that's not all uh, of uh, the sound elements in your brain uh, um, either. So this is a, a sort a, a different understanding of the same idea that was uh, existent in the early part of 20th century. But the things on the left are the interesting ones. That is a list, okay, list of things. Syntactic terminals, which refer to the syntactic derivation. Then vocabulary items, they refer to actually the spell out point, that is the surface structure. When you are finished your computation and you're ready to speak the sentence, in your head you have finished the computation, of course you're not uh, deliberately articulating that process, you are automatically in you know one millionth of a nanosecond, you um, uh, compute a, a sentence. So the sentence that I just spoke, I must have done it just a little bit before uh, I have computed it in my head and then it came out of my mouth. Um, and then vocabulary items were put. So this is different from the familiar generative grammar paradigm of Chomsky and uh, where you start off with the words right at the beginning. Here we don't start off with the words, we start with the structure. And the claim is when a child is acquiring language, she or he is not acquiring words. They are of course acquiring words, but what comes prior is an understanding of the structure. So a little bit of like the, um, you know, uh, Lego kind of pieces that children play with, blocks, building blocks. So they have little such building blocks uh, which they acquire. And then finally, you have something called encyclopedia, which is uh, not a very accurate name for something which gives you the interpretation, the semantic interpretation. So when you look at the timing of various components, we realize that there hangs a tail, which I will come back to uh, right at the end of the talk if there is time. And I suspect that I won't have time. So I'll just give you a brief idea. This was also the last part of the abstract that the proposal will be, and this will be referring to joint work with uh, uh, Jyoti uh, Sharma, uh, one of my senior research students. Uh, we've been working at looking at this language in Mizoram, Mara, and um, there's a forthcoming uh, sort of longish uh, article that will come out from a book in Oxford University Press uh, soon, uh, we hope. And there we propose that uh, a purely syntactic um, application of agreement uh, theories will not derive the complicated structure that uh, of agreement that Tibeto, this Tibeto-Burman languages show. And uh, we have to take recourse to uh, also a purely morphological work, uh, uh, description or uh, theoretical uh, explanation will not work. So we will have to um, uh, look at a morphosyntactic process of deriving. I just finished saying what is the conclusion of the talk because I think I won't have time to really come to details of it. I'll revise it again anyway. So the important part is this morphology appearing between this surface structure and the phonetic form. And uh, uh, vocabulary items are uh, based on morphology uh, inserted. So these lists are accessed at different points in the derivation. <clears throat> okay, so this is a summary of the first part of the talk, which was an introduction to the mainstream agreement uh, theoretical um, overview. Uh, that is what uh, coming together of tense and agreement, how tense and agreement S, AGR S and AGR O, and when morphology between syntax and phonetics. <clears throat> Let's move on to our case scenario, okay? And here begins the story. So the first story I call the Eastern story number one, okay? 
Eastern story number one. Um, now that we have understood what agreement is, and we've seen a little bit of the politics of the codification of the theory of that agreement, let us look at a very special type of agreement. And uh, it is called multiple agreement phenomena. Throughout this talk, I'll refer to uh, multiple agreement phenomena, or in short, MAP, uh, for this kind of agreement. I'll give an example from a sort of neutral from our perspective, but also interesting um, language, uh, not from what the first point says. So within the Magdan group, I refer to, and why I refer to, I'll come to a little later, later. What distinguishes this language is from the central Middle Indo-Aryan languages is their multiple agreement system. This is my claim, my work for last five, seven, eight years or so. Okay, but I'll come back to that part of the uh, work later. But let's look at a neutral language. This is a language called Basque. Okay, it's a language spoken in Europe, but it is a kind of a misfit, you know, quote unquote misfit among the languages of um, uh, Europe. It's a kind of an isolate and, you know, mark the, or remember the word misfit because we'll roll back and go back to the history of the language situation in our uh, country and see um, how this word becomes actually important. Uh, now see that this is the, uh, this looks like a complete sentence, but it's not the complete sentence in Bas yet. So you have, uh, uh, so uh, sort of my friend uh, saw me, that's the translation, it will come, don't worry. The translation will come, but you have this uh, object, you have the subject and you have the verb. It looks like the complete sentence, but what is most crucial is the auxiliary that Naik is that auxiliary and look at the gloss you have a green color first person singular that refers to me okay so that refers to the object me which is there in green color in the sentence then you have a blue color three three singular third singular that is a friend the subject okay so both the object and the subject are marked within the sentence at the same time but of course, there is something little worrying about this. What is this two doing here? Okay, because the sentence is the, the friend saw me. That means uh, a third person uh, did something, which is the act of seeing a first person, all right? So there is a third person and first person. There is no second person. So where is the second person coming from? Well, this is familiar again to some people in the audience. This is called the addressee agreement or allocutive agreement. And this you will find also in uh, some languages, not many languages. Uh, there is no walls map on this, but there, this is called uh, address agreement that you must have heard. Now I go to my work, which is multiple agreement, let's say uh, in uh, some of these languages, and I'm giving example from Mathili. So some Indo-Aryan languages um, like Mathili, Magi, Angika, etc., all have uh, Bajika, all have multiple agreements. So, just look at an example from Maithili. This is from uh, a very good book, Ramatha Yadav's uh, 1996 uh, Maithili grammar published from Muto. And you can see here the color code should tell you that there is a representation of the subject in the verb, right? And there's a representation of the object in the verb, right? And this is those who are not familiar with these languages, they should think a little. If, they are, if you're familiar with an agreement language, like let's say Hindi or Urdu, then you should find this to be a misfit. It is not really like Hindi or Urdu at all. Because here in Hindi or Urdu, what you find is you have either the subject agreement or the object agreement. You don't have them at the same time. You don't have simultaneous subject and object or subject and another argument agreement, which is in fact called multiple agreement. And the pattern you see here is the verb carrying an agreement of the subject marker, uh, agreement marker of the subject and an agreement marker of the object. Um, so this is unlike Basque, this example does not show the addressee agreement uh, element so that uh, um, uh, strange two, which was appearing in the Basque data in the earlier slide, that is uh, not here in this example, but these languages do also show. Now you can, but you can appreciate one thing that these two agreement slots that we saw in the syntactic structure become highly relevant when they're kind of uh, 
alive or active at the same time. For Hindi, you will say, well, either the AGRS is active or AGRO is active. And people have gone on and uh, proposed language typologies based on that, like whether it is a nominative accusative language or an ergative absolutive language. Some people have proposed based on that fact. But here is a language where both the slots, the agreement slots are active at the same time. However, and um, um, this is not the only story. Okay, I can give another slide, which is also from Mathili. And you can see uh, various pattern here within a noun phrase. You have this uh, agreement, uh, parts of the noun phrase. I won't go into the detail, but you can see the same kind of crossing arrows which show you this uh, pattern. And the pattern is, uh, uh, again, similar. The subject agreement morpheme appears before the, um, well, uh, this is uh, within, both of them are within the same noun phrase. So, but still, if you consider the higher one as subject, quote unquote, subject of a noun phrase, that appears higher. Um, now, um, let's roll back, okay? Let us push back um, a little and look at uh, um, two contrasting view about uh, Indo-Aryan language situation in this you know, plot of land, since I'm talking about map in various ways, in this plot of land. So you all imagine this Eastern region, this Eastern story one, you can imagine this. And recently I gave a talk about 10 days back where I talked about and sort of uh, in my research, reveals many of you know that there is this uh, Indo-Aryan intrusion theory of uh, the appearance of Indo-Aryan within the what is now called the Indian subcontinent uh, from the northwest frontier um, <clears throat> and uh, there were apparently two waves of that kind of migration and many of you probably know from a very well-known text uh, which is uh, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee's book on origin and development of the Bengali language, but actually the original, the first uh, two waves theory is actually uh, a German Indologist uh, by the name of Hunley, which many people here in the audience would have heard because this book from 19, uh, 1880, long time back, over 140 years ago, is uh, quite well known. And he in fact wanted to write a book, he says in the introduction, on the Eastern Hindi languages, okay? But then it became too specific and he was advised to write a book on uh, uh, grammar, comparative grammar, and he did that. But uh, it's a very illustrative introduction that one should read. And you can easily guess from this quotation, uh, which I'll read out for everybody, from these indications, it would appear that the Magadhi tongue is the older of the two. That is, that is, its occupation of North India preceded the development and extension of Saurasani. Saurasani. Perhaps this may be taken to point to the fact that two great immigrations of people of Aryan stock into India took place at different periods, both speaking essentially the same language, though in two different varieties. Okay, He has not, he, of course, at that time, they had not looked at the, uh, the uh, Western scholars who are um, uh, given a bad name by being referred to as uh, uh, the Orientalist, but uh, at least the linguist among them were pretty good linguists. And I don't make any apologies for using their work because they're Orientalist, okay? So I refuse to accept the sort of post-colonial critical look at uh, Orientalist, which you don't, don't have no post-colonialism, many people do refer to in those terms, refer to these early work in those terms. But they were very good work, very thorough work um, compared to what happening otherwise. <clears throat> uh, so this is um, definitely an idea that there were two varieties, at least if not two different types of languages, and there were probably two different migrations. This is an idea which is kind of incomplete, and we don't have now time in this talk to go about it or discuss it. But uh, there is an east-west part of this story, which was clear from the quotation, but if it was not, then you can uh, read further on. So he says, Hurley further on says, these circumstances seem to disclose the fact that sometime in the remote past, the Magadhi uh, must have 
reached up to the extreme western frontiers and been the only language of north india and now this is not a very um, uh, you know uh, one only kind of quotation or idea this appears again and again in various texts again i don't have time to look at everything and show you everything but i'll give you an idea first of all herney himself this uh, talks about pashto and nuristani languages of afghanistan um, which show actually magadhi prakrit features some of these features are listed here um, so one should really compare them in the more modern language versions herney considers this as an evidence for the presence of magadhi prakrit that far in the northwest okay so the thesis is somewhat incomplete as it leaves many questions unanswered nevertheless strongly suggests that prakrit prakrits were are not the uh, not the tongues derived from sanskrit that's the main point of this view this so called orientalist view i would say very strongly suggests and implies that prakrit and sanskrit are not the same thing sans prakrit is not something which is derived from sanskrit this is so, this is what we get to hear and we get to learn we grow up uh, learning that that prakrit is somehow sort of a un uh, well i can't say unnatural because the name is prakrit but somehow uh, as it's called the fallen off language because uh, later on in some versions of prakrit which were not used for kavya uh, the language of kavya for indian indian classical language was given by prakrit um uh, sanskrit adopted that stylistics of kavya poetry um so uh, when it is not used for poetry or prose or other specific purposes like drama for example so you you find in natya shastra for example um uh, prakrit is uh, a, a role given to certain characters uh then it is called the pra- the language of the people the masses is actually called uh, apabhramsa which is like fallen off the kind of thing it's kind of a uh faulty language but that's not the case at all if you believe in this kind of um, um story and uh, evidence now let us look at other small pieces now this is the view from the orient not the so called orientalist so this would be um uh, referred i j- earlier referred to swanti kumar chatterjee's book and i don't know if you can see my uh, book here so this is the book origin and development of the bengali language its thesis turned into a book as early as 1926 the work was done in university of london but it's a great book and we all refer to it all the time now and there he shows um, that uh, sunitik kumar chatterjee shows uh, evidence of the influence of the east that was already present even in the rigvedic time so around let's say 1500 bce um we uh, so here uh, the direction uh, and you can see that there was a eastern um, element in it for example vikrata for vikrata or uh, danda for uh, you know uh, reconstructed dandra or dendron in greek uh, rigveda also mentions once a country called kikata uh, country home to non aryans they show narya nirvasa okay narya so non aryans later sanskrit writers identify kikata as a magadh okay as magadh and in if you go by uh, satpata brahmana you see it describes easterners as asurya demonic in nature and in you know, these are some quotations there are many many such uh, instances uh, and according to uh, sruti kumar chatterjee after 1000 bce the aryan tongue was already established in the east that is in the magadh in bihar uh, uh, though it transformed so you know there are lots of evidence for this transformation and uh, but you will see that this view is quite different this view shows that kind of prakrit derived from sanskrit that is something which is later okay it's very different from the hernley view which we saw 2 uh, minutes ago that um, uh, you have evidence of prakrit magadhi prakrit as far as uh, northwest in nuristani and afghanistani now um now we are interested in the language of the masses so what is happening there okay their speech is described and in again in various texts as uh, uh, adurukta vakyam duraktam ahur it's very interesting which is not uttered with difficulty as being uttered with difficulty that indicates that this is a second language speaker so it indicates the underlying influence of a prakritic tongue a prakritic form of uh, speech 
uh, thus they are sort of second language speakers of Indo-Aryan. Now, <coughs> that might sort of give it a lower status of Prakrit, but I think for my story, Prakrits are of utmost importance. And it's not that I'm picking references selectively, it is all over the place that Prakrit became important. For example, this is oft quoted thing myself, I have quoted this as I told you 10 days ago, but earlier as well. Magha Desha, let me give you the uh, Devnagari version. Magha Desha hai kanchan puri, desha bhala par bhasha buri. Rehlu magha kahlu re, tekrala ki marbere. So this is a very interesting, uh, um, uh, you can say, couplet. And uh, here, you know, um, um, the importance of the Eastern languages could not be ignored as it became the dominant language of the North. Here, uh, the poet is uh, especially in the, so this is the translation for those who won't get the translation. Magha is a land of gold. The country is good, but the language is vile, quote unquote, huh? vile. I lived there and got into the habit of saying re. So you can see this beautiful, you know, poetic sort of um, um, uh, poetic uh, license and sort of poetic witticism, you can say, that the poet takes here, uh, uh, which asks the pertinent, you know, rhetorical, it's a rhetorical question, but a pertinent rhetorical question, which in a sort of points a finger at this tag of so-called upper bhrangsa or fallen speech, Okay, will you um, will you really hit me if I use the word re? So this is for me really the speech of the masses, and that establishes the importance of um, the importance of uh, this region, this variety. And now I will briefly show you why I call them Central Magadhan Prakrit. You can look at this uh, y-axis, which is a time axis and the uh, x-axis is the region axis and as you go from the west or to northwest to east you find this uh, uh, this thing derivation and uh, c here stands for central and uh, m stands for uh, magthi and uh, p stands for prakrit so summarizing the linguistic development geographically and temporally i introduced this term and it will be found in uh, my paper uh, published in Linguistic Analysis in 2016. Um, here I call them Central Magadhan Prakrit for various reasons. One good reason is that, uh, well, uh, Grierson and Hernley, at that time, the uh, denotation of these languages was Bihari languages. But that's a wrong term because there's nothing like, uh, you know, uh, there is no Bihari language, right? There is no language called Bihari. Like there is no language called Uttar Pradeshi or Madhya Pradeshi, etc. Um, so languages of Bihar uh, cannot be called Bihari languages and for various other reasons I uh, gave this name which I have been using um, for a long time. This thus uh, establishes uh, a clear sort of line of difference between Magadhi and Northern Western languages and um, uh, you can see that they diverge and this has been well coded. These two kinds of Prakrit, the Magadhan Prakrit and the Shaurasani Prakrit, the central uh, MIA uh, and the uh, Saurasani Prakrit are distinguished. There are many, many other phonetic and uh, phonological properties which distinguish these two types of varieties, which Hornley called, uh, you know, um, varieties. This divergence is visible in obvious morphological and syntactic differences that I noted here. So this kind of um, uh, um, adds uh, to the proposal uh, and it appears perfectly, again, another, uh, towards the end, I'm giving another quote towards the end of this part uh, from Hernley, it appears perfectly justifiable to consider the Western Hindi and Eastern Hindi as being as completely distinct languages. Okay. Now to this source, I add my bit, which is the multiple agreement story that also distinguishes these two types of languages. Now, um, when multiple agreement, uh, phenomena was noticed. All these linguists were uh, very careful to notice this. I will pick a later linguist, again, Chatterjee. And some people might be familiar uh, of my uh, critique of Chatterjee in this domain and other domains as well. So uh, these are the quotations from, again, ODBL. The intricacies of the later Maithili were absent in old Maithili. Okay, Chatterjee is clearly not happy to find these affixes 
talking about the language of vidyapati 14th century especially noticeable is the simplicity of the verb system with its freedom from the ramifications of pronominal infixes and affixes you know the writing gives uh, gives away your feelings what you feel about it these ramifications is metaphorically is an uncomfortable feeling that where are these little affixes coming from um and this is a giveaway that he hasn't really understood the agreement system which is strange because grierson's famous work in 1887 181903 uh, looking at so called bihari languages seven volumes seven little volumes in every volume he painstakingly looks at different types of sentences and had given a detailed you know one at least one page explanation of this and i am quoting something he also uses metaphoric language the principal difficulty to the beginner in the study of mathili is the bewildering maze of the verbal forms but then he is not bothered by it this is due to the fact that the verb agrees not only with the subject but with its object as well so chatterjee further conjectures that the pronominal affixation could be due to influx of coal people from the south coal is of course munda so that's our eastern story number 2 the second player in this east so here you can look at this very familiar map again you have seen many people have seen those who work on munda languages from this excellent volume um you can see it's very um, looking at this map you can easily imagine that there is possibility of contact of munda languages austroasiatic languages and these languages in bihari or the bihar that is cmp languages and therefore uh, it is not um, unusual for chatterjee to think of a situation of contact now very briefly i'll go through this because it's a kind of different kind of domain of work there are if you're not familiar there are kind of six positions of this munda um, or uh, slash or to say you can say uh, of origin aa originates in southeast asia migrated into india aa originated in india migrated into southeast asia the munda branch of aa originated in india and the monkhamer branch in southeast asia out of africa thesis of to india to southeast asia these are all from like 19th uh, 20th century interacting with india specific indigenous groups on the way same as ford that is out of africa but the india specific groups that is munda as having migrated from central asia earlier the last one has not been proposed and that is my current research that out of africa but via andaman and nicobar islands and southeast asia and through the coast of myanmar to into india to the northeast of india um so but that i won't be going into it now um there is other work where i have looked at munda languages and again this is something familiar from some of you who have uh, worked on these languages that the phenomena on surface looks very similar to uh, what we saw in uh, mathili in cmp languages in general okay that you have these two affixes one uh, standing for the subject and one standing for the object uh, but they are two different systems okay so this is to remind you this was the uh, mathili system they are more like agreement affixes and here is your munda system they are more like pronominal clitics how do we know because if you look at the actual pronominals in uh, uh, let's say this is in mundari you find them to be quite similar you can the uh, the element on the left of slash in each cell and to the right of slash are quite similar that is not the case with the cmp languages like mathili magi uh, angika etc so that is usually one of the differences there are many differences but we won't make the difference uh, a big deal because this is not a purely syntax talk now the idea existed at that time this is we have shifted we are not into that the uh, um, early period we shifted into this uh, from the text of let's say british irish scottish linguists and uh, in even in america how they were looking at it and one theory of course was the substratum influence theory which atji was referring to that himalayish or munda languages show pronominalization in fullest form while other turanian languages either lack it or show impoverished forms i won't go into turanian but because i have looked at it in detail in other talks and some of you were present in that talk but it is a, a waste paper basket category uh, to give you a very short summary uh, he did not even hint at a directional view of the spread of this feature from munda the substratal munda to tb influence was a very popular thesis in the 19th 
uh, a century. So this quotation from Kuno, it therefore seems probable that Mundas or tribes speaking a language connected with those now in use among the Mundas have once lived in the Himalayas and have left their stamp on the dialects there spoken at the present day. This was the number four thesis of this Munda from this Himalayas to uh, in the UP uh, Bihar area and not uh, so this is one of the things. Hodgson, of course, very carefully observes 10 properties of this language system, and many of them still hold true. So again, a good linguist. However, the debate soon shifted to our third player in this story, and that is the third story. This is the, as far as agreement is concerned, this is the last story. This is the Eastern story number three. So here we're going, we're shifting a little bit as we shift the debate from east to the northeast. Um, so they were uh, somewhat later about this third player, the story of agreement. So Henderson, for example, says, pronominalization is after all a genuine Tibeto-Burman family trait. That is, it's something which happened in uh, Tibeto-Burman uh, by itself, okay? Then Bauman, and again, a great thesis, I'm a great admirer of this thesis, uh, Berkeley, University of Berkeley, University of California Berkeley thesis convincingly argues that pronominalization as a feature is widely distributed across North, Northwest, Northeast, and Indochina, which gives credit to a native origin in within TB of pronominalization. He, in fact, points out these three differences. <coughs> the TB has more alternate pronominal forms than Munda. Okay, so Munda has restricted forms. The fixed position of affixes in TB as opposed to Munda and those who have worked on Munda would know this, the pronomination system of TB languages is much more complex. I'll refer to this towards the end of the talk than the Munda languages. Uh, there is of course one more that uh, those again who are familiar with Munda languages will know that this is a phenomena which you see mostly in the so-called Kherwarian language, that is the Northern Munda language. So you see in Santali, Mundari, Ho, um, yeah, et cetera. And Pino's quotation here, from 1966, uh, in Proto-Munda, the pronouns properly were independent, isolatable, free forms. The affix character of the pronouns, which were incorporated in the verb complex as subject or object respectively, is of a more recent date. There are lots, so, lots to say about this, but I won't go into it. This is the area of the pronominalized tibeto burman languages. This is also from Bauman's thesis, which is based on, this map is based on Schof, uh, Schaffer, but I have quoted, I have given color codes and show you the pockets. So there are kind of three uh, uh, pockets, you could say. One, uh, Gyalrung is kind of an isolate in Northwest China, not, uh, yeah. Uh, but otherwise you see the Himalayan foothills, the Kiranti languages, you see that uh, that's the Kiranti languages, so Tibeto Himalayan languages. Then you see again an isolate like uh, Nokte um, there in blue. But then uh, majorly you see in the Koki languages, Kokichin languages of uh, south of uh, Manipur, Mizoram, and also in Myanmar, you find that pocket. And you know, other work which we have done uh, um, uh, show the differences between these, but this is not part of the story here. But the point is that this is the third player in our story of agreement. Now again, for this also, let's push back a little and go back to the ancient times one more time. And this is the origin of the word Kirata, which again is very familiar from many discussions, and I will only refer to some. This term is used somewhat pejoratively in the classical literatures while non-Aryan tribes living in the mountains, cave dwelling like uh, Guhabham uh, Kiratam, Ayurveda. Then there is a stereotyping based on race, etc. So you can see this uh, quotation from uh, Mahabharata. Uh, which translates into Prag Jyotisha, that is Assam, was then surrounded by Kiratas and Chinas and with many other warriors dwelling by the sea coast. I have a different story to tell about the sea coast, but my, my uh, purpose here to quote this is to look at the geography. And here I am looking at the geography. Okay, So you can see uh, there is also lots of quotations, lots of ideas about the description of Kiratas in the Vedic literature. Uh, they, uh, the Vedic literature itself provides an uh, idea of, you know, determines the place of their habitation. 
There's a quotation here, the region lying between the two rivers, Arun and Dudkoshi in Nepal, is still known as Kirata Desha. This is from Atkinson, 1883. There are enough if references I have, from whatever I have get, uh, gathered so far from classical literature and the 1920th century scholars work to draw the rough area that can be called the ancient Kirata Desha, which I've drawn in the next slide. This is my drawing from Google map by uh, actually uh, looking at not just these two rivers, but many other text references, textual references. And you can see this is a huge area extending, I don't know if you can see, extending from, uh, you know, including Bhutan, Nepal, uh, Himalayas, <clears throat> and uh, part of <clears throat> Bihar, uh, Uttar Pradesh, part of North Bengal, uh, Northeast, etc. <clears throat> okay, this is of course not accurate, but this is uh, based on the references, textual, textual references. So now this is my thesis. I think I may be ending um, towards the end of my time. I don't know that how much I have uh, uh, how much I have left <clears throat> time wise, but this is the third possibility. Why I'm calling it third? Because the first possibility was the idea of contact between uh, these Eastern Indo-Aryan languages, the CMP languages, and the <clears throat> Munda languages. Okay, most probably from Munda to these languages. That was a uh, earlier idea, and later idea also brought in. How did Munda languages uh, get it? Okay, and there were many kinds of uh, research to show that some people would say this is Munda specific thing. Some people said, well, no, it's not Munda specific, and maybe it came from Tibet Burman. So then people started looking at the debate shifted, as I told you, towards nearer our time to uh, looking at uh, Tibet Burman agreeing languages, and there are two major pockets: the Tibet Himalayan languages and the Southern Kokichin languages. And uh, there the debate was that, well, this seems to be original. It seems to be something which originated in the language group itself. Whether it influenced any other language, that's on the position the scholars would take. But I am going to take this position. I'm going to entertain. Obviously, this is a thesis, a hypothesis under consideration. Given that there was this massive spread of Kirata Desha and that the Vedic Aryans and uh, Kiratas were cohabiting at the same place. If not, you know, uh, Kiratas were earlier, they were cohabiting at the same place. This gives a third possibility. Okay. Roughly the Tibet to Burman group, and there is debate on that, and that would come out in future work that I'm looking at. This is most probably uh, a different stock of people, not really all of Tibet to Burman. And that distinguishes these two groups, the TB in general and the Kiranti languages. Uh, roughly Tibet Burman, we can consider the coexisting with the early Indo Aryans, if not earlier. The third possibility of Tibet Burman influencing some Indo Aryan languages to develop multiple agreement. This MA here is multiple agreement arises. Okay, coming to middle Indo, -Ary Indo Aryan period, there is a lot of, in fact, evidence of contact at least of Mathili with Newari at Tibet Burman language. So you have Mathili literature, you have Charyapadas, which of course is a a little funny story I was telling to some scholars, some engineers yesterday, that how the Assamese, the Bengalis, the Oriyas, and the Mathilis all claim Charyapadas to be their uh, language, speaking their language. Most probably is, as Ramata Yadav correctly um, mentions, most, most probably this is a mishprah. It's a mixed kind of thing because of the movement of people, the Siddhas, movement of the Siddhas, from Mithila region all the way to the northeast to Assam. So it became Rajabuli, etc. You know, all that story most of you are familiar with. But supposed to be 10th century, much before the actually the new Indo Aryan or modern Indo Aryan languages. And so, therefore, this rush to claim Charyapadas as their own language. As you know, the story, this uh, manuscript was dis discovered by Haraprasad Shastri in Nepal. And uh, he came back and wrote an article in English and then he wrote an, a book in Bengali uh, in 1916. So in 1894, he went a couple of times to Kathmandu and got these manuscripts and then copied, because that time you copy by hand, copied these things and then um, it was claimed to be, you know, uh, origin of uh, Bangla. But of course, uh, if you read it, if you try to read it with modern language, to me it sounds, I mean, I should not say anything controversial, so I won't say it, uh, it doesn't sound uh, Bangla to me. 
but uh, certainly there are uh, elements of all these languages that I talk about. But look at the evidence of Maithili literature, which is actually kind of old, so you could say in the modern, uh, this thing, uh, within the Indo-Aryan groups, it's the uh, oldest literature, maybe after, just after uh, a Marathi, except Marathi, this is uh, one of the oldest literature. And uh, the this contact of 14th and 18th century in Nepal, because there were Mithila, uh, Mithili kings in Nepal, and there was like, uh, five centuries of contact with Newari and Malla kings. And this uh, language, sort of court language, shifted from court language and the language uh, these kings would talk to the people in the Kirata Desha, the Kiratas, is also Maithili, shifted from Bengali to Maithili. Um, and also there is no, and interestingly, you know, there is no comparative literature of that period, um, 14 to 19, uh, 18th century, from uh, 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 from Bihar, actually, but there is a lot of literature from uh, from Nepal, and all these kings were great writers. They were writing dramas after drama. Somebody would write like thirty dramas, and like twenty of them in uh, Newari script using the Newari script. And the language itself is different because there would be Maithili, or there would be uh, sometime uh, um, sometimes some characters would be speaking Prakrit. So and uh, and some of the scene changes in the drama, you know, instructions for the scene changes would mean actually Newari, and the script will be mostly Newari. So this kind of massive contact with contact with the Kiratas in Maithili and uh, the Newari uh, kings also writing in Maithili, this kind of contact cannot go unnoticed. And I don't know why uh, authors have not actually explored it. So I looked at very this in, very interesting book by again Ramadha Yadav, there's a more recent book from 2011, uh, which is uh, a translation and transcription of this text, uh, um, um, Parsh, uh, uh, Parshram Upakhyan Nataka. It's not uh, Parasharam, and he talks about why it is not, therefore most probably it was Maithili. And here is the book, I don't know if you can see it. Here is the book. And uh, what I'm going to show you now, that uh, because of, uh, this is of course much later, uh, this drama, but this is consistent with the other inscriptions that have been found. I have not had the time to look at those, but uh, 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 wait a minute. Yeah, um, so uh, let's look at some of these. And here you uh, here you see a folio from, you know, Yadavji's book. This is a folio number 50B, uh, and this is actually written in the Newari script, although you can actually read it. And the crucial thing appears in the last line. I have marked it in the next uh, picture. Uh, and this is like, Aneka Saina Dei Chia. Okay, that Chia part, I have underlined. That is the auxiliary. And those Maithili speakers uh, in the audience would uh, know that that is auxiliary, which is first person subject and second person honorific together. In Maithili, which is different from uh, Maghi Angika in this respect and Vajika, is that you can't really separate out these affixes, but they're together. That's uh, Ramatar in 96. Um, a book uh, clearly uh, says it and shows it, but they are um, fused morphemes of these two persons and honorificity. So this Chia, uh, Chia actually, Chia here in this appears. And in the next folio, this is um, 57A, and I've highlighted the, <clears throat> you can, uh, can you see the Devnagari one? So here, Hame Ahake Chinha Chiae. So Chiae chie, chie, chie is also uh, a variation of the Chia that is first and first person subject and second honorific. Okay, so this is something which uh, indicates that this multiple agreement that we are interested was actually very clearly there. Now question arises with regard to my thesis that why not other Indo-Aryan languages? I'm finishing the presentation. So if I'm running out of time, you know, please give me three, four minutes. Um, why not other Indo-Aryan languages? Well, some of you would in, uh, would already guess that uh, it's not other Indo-Aryan. I don't want you to read all the text yet. So other Indo-Aryan languages, because I've already established the importance of this region in the geography, okay? So we're looking at this Eastern UP, Bihar range all the way to, let's say, uh, North Bengal. And then we talked about the Kirata Desha possibility. So we're looking at that. So therefore, um, this uh, spread now, <clears throat> actually, 
the spread of the feature I'm claiming is from the northeast to the east. Uh, given that the Kiratas, uh, this I've already uh, read out earlier, but why not other languages? Well, because CMP languages were already ripe to receive multiple agreement phenomena. This is absolutely new thing, which people may not be familiar with, but um, there are the three reasons. There are more reasons. I'll give you only three here. That Prakrit provided a kind of register and this will relate to my earlier um, appreciation of the importance of Prakrit. It provided a register to liberate oneself from the acceptable, you know, kind of a claustrophobic register that uh, Sanskrit would provide. And it brings the interlocutor or the other into a conversation. Now, this should ring bells in your head because I show, showed you the address agreement in Basque. I showed you address agreement. Well, I didn't show you. I told you about address agreement in the CMP, Magadhan languages. The second reason, this is interesting. This is from uh, actually a very old, um, um, a very old uh, text uh, about which I have some doubts and I was communicating uh, actually with the help of your new director, Professor Shalinder Mohan. I was communicating with Vien Jha and he could not solve the problem, but I'm trying to still figure it out. But this quotation <clears throat> from Ghatke's work, uh, on Concord, um, <clears throat> you can see, in all such cases, which usually occur at the end of a chapter, I didn't give you the example, we must suppose some kind of change of thought in the mind of the writers who try to conclude the discourse on some moral point with a direct address to the hearers, forgetting for the time being that the whole of the preceding chapter was a general statement in the third person. Okay, So this suddenly becomes an address to the hearer. And this is my idea of bringing in the other, the interlocutor in your sentence, in fact, and the development. Now, so basically this Prakrit, earlier form of Prakrit and these Magadhan languages are just waiting, ready to accept this kind of multiple agreement phenomena. And then with the contact with the Kiratas, my thesis is that this was readily accepted. The syntactic connection between, also a third reason, the syntactic connection between honorificity, which is a very prominent marker of these CMP languages, not the tibet Roman languages, uh, denoted by this address agreement and multiple agreement, which I've explored, you know, syntactically and theoretically in earlier work, is also a reason. So I think all these three, four reasons together uh, gives an answer why no other Indo-Aryan languages got this uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay, so. <clears throat> That rests my case, and I'll chalte chalte. Just at the end, I'll give you two slides to show why these examples from Tibeto-Burman become important. This is an example from uh, a language in Nepal, Sintang, and uh, from uh, Netra Podyal's uh, PhD. So you, you can see the same phenomena happening here. But on the surface, it may look very similar to the CMP languages of Bihar and the Munda languages of Jharkhand but not really. And this is our current work. And as I said at the beginning, um, uh, work with Jyoti Sharma, which will be forthcoming. And this is an example from Mara. And the, interestingly, what you notice here, that there is a split, not only of the person, but also of the number. And the split is across the uh, verb. So some elements are um, sort of, uh, you, can, you can call it the uh, pro proclitic form, that is a prefixal to the verb. So pull is the verb. And you can see first person of the subject, plural of the subject are in the proclitic form. Also the second person, uh, second person of the object. It's okay, number, uh, sorry, second number of the object. Uh, second number of the, so this should have been plural. Yeah, second person of the object is in the um, uh, prefixal part. And, but the second person, uh, second number uh, of the object, and the plural uh, number of the object is on the uh, suffixal part, the enclitic. Okay, so this is much more complex, obviously. So this is the pattern you can see. And this uh, uh, cannot be uh, really theoretically derived through a purely syntactic story. And you know, you know, ask ask us. We really suffered through this. We tried to by force derive it through a purely syntactic account. That's not possible. There are too many complications, and then your syntax becomes kind of useless. It is not possible to derive it purely morphologically. Again, try us. We have tried that as well. So what happens? We propose is that uh, you need to have a morphosyntactic account, 
and that should take you back to that uh, first uh, kind of uh, inverted y diagram which i uh, mentioned at the end of uh, when uh, that diagram which i uh, showed you in this uh, no i don't have yeah um, well, here, here, yeah, this diagram. So there I, you know, sort of end the talk that the architecture, grammar, the especially that morphology part, this morphology part, which appears uh, is very important. Okay, and this uh, stag staggered in insertion of items, elements, as it is the model in distributed morphology is something we should really use to um, and look at the uh, theoretical part of these languages and Tibeto Verman gives us a clue. Okay, so I finished the talk here. I don't have a thank you slide uh, and because I was preparing the uh, references and it was not over and um, I apologize for that. But anybody who wants the references, I can send them across. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful talk. They rightly say a beautiful story. Uh, a, a, a beautiful story always has five components. What, how, and when, and also the history, geography, deviation. And it always leads you with the possibilities and some questions. And your presentation has all of these components. Thank you so much. And now the house is open for the questions and the inquiries. Uh, we are also online on the YouTube. And so the questions or the inquiries which will be posted there, I will read out uh, for you uh, to the speaker. Uh, but the house is now open for the question. Now there is uh, like uh, there, 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 on, on the Google Meet uh, nearby the video icon, there is one hand raise option. I think one by one we can use it and so then ask the speaker. We can uh, we, we can we can ask and put our queries before the speaker. The house is open. Uh, in the meanwhile, I think uh, the people ask the question. I will read out one comment which has come on uh, like YouTube online, uh, like our like YouTube recording from Professor uh, Dr. Rajesh Sasdeva, our former director of Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore. Uh, Professor Sasdeva writes, I really like Tanmay's analysis for he's willing to bring in diachronic facts and the social context of language contact and variation and studies into it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is an important aspect and uh, uh, I'm glad that it uh, went across and the audience understood. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And those uh, who have some kind of data streaming problem, they can also write their question on the chat box. I will read out uh, your questions uh, uh, for you to the speaker. Uh, the first question uh, has come from the Guru Jagan. Uh, sir, please. Uh, sir, can you go back to that uh, Mara slide and explain what exactly is the uh, problem there? Oh, okay, let me uh, show it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it is a. Uh, um, see, the problem is that the second person, uh, the object, the person of the object is on the other side of the verb, on the prefixal side of the verb. And the number of the object, plural, that's on the enclitic side or the affixal, suffixal side of, uh, yeah, of the verb. So to derive this, um, you could try various things like, um, well, other people may not uh, know this, like bottom-up derivation, I won't call it bottom-up agree, bottom-up derivation, or uh, top-down derivation and a mix of two. And the other things that we explored is also that within bottom-up, you have top-down, uh, etc. But it just complicates the syntax too much. So um, this is just one bit of uh, complication, but there are other bits of complication. Uh, yes, sir. I was also wondering about the um, number morphology, which is different for plural for the subject and also for the object. So yeah. that would also be uh, uh, difficult to derive, I would say. Even yeah, yeah. Actually, it all the morphology. Uh, there's a lot of suppletion. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, sorry, not subjects, uh, syncretism. There's a lot of syncretism, and that also indicates that uh, something like distributed morphology, distributed morphology, 
would be better suited for um, especially the uh, you know the pattern or the paradigm in the agreeing tibeto burman languages because you know syncretism if you draw we have actually done that we drawn all the morphemes and a table you find patches of syncretism that is the same form being used sometime as a subject uh, number and also um, the object number and sometimes they are different depending on uh, which argument position they are appearing so that kind of argument position in the semantic let's say argument structure and the syntactic position determines their morphological forms and uh, syncretism cannot be completely explained from morphological theories alone that's why i said purely morphological also will fail because you will again you you will end up constructing like we did i think jyoti did uh, construct like uh, seven or eight uh, you know readjustment rules for the morphology component for uh, or two or three affixes okay so that becomes a very unwieldy morphology but do you have a question do you have a comment on this um, no i was just wondering um, if we have a different number morphology for first and second person um, what do we expect for the third person uh, and things like that so well yeah yeah third person you know in the um, in these languages third person is the uh, least marked so you find in the tibet burman neighboring languages Third, third person is rarely marked. There are contexts, very well defined contexts, when third person is uh, a mark, but uh, usually it is zero. And there's a whole lot of descriptive literature, historical literature, from uh, mainly from Scott Delancey's work, but all, all the other uh, you know uh, main actors of that story, uh, where there's a fight going on for like 30 years, uh, whether this is proto Tibeto Burman or this is something which developed later. So that their interest is that. but you will find that um, yeah you will find that um, um, that phenomena um, uh, also in those descriptive literature as well but this is a very tibet to burman agreement kind of phenomena okay sir thank you that's interesting uh, the, the second question comes from uh, uh, the second question comes from dr ananta sahu from it madras okay hello sir Hi. Hello, sir. How are you? It's okay. a wonderful talk. It's, it's really <laughs> nice. So basically, the diachrony of uh, this Prakrit connection with the um, you know Eastern languages—that's that's something uh, new that I'm trying to understand. Um, I would be very happy if we can get a couple of references that you have shared, uh, like that you haven't really put it in the slide. So kindly send it to me when you have time. Uh, um, but otherwise, I'm trying to understand uh, uh, the morphological syntax of honorification, since uh, it's also an important part of the agreement system. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, you know, we don't find it in the first person, uh, as well as not in the third person much. So the honorification in plural. uh that's uh, the, the the morphemic marking is uh, similar in most of the indo-aryan languages uh, categorically i'm talking about odia so uh, probably i would need a bit of help to understand the morpho syntax of honorification uh, in the agreement uh, uh, domain so uh, how to approach for it yeah uh, uh, one area well you could just look at my 2016 paper we have we have already gone through that okay, okay. Uh, uh, so yeah. maybe just a bit of more uh, Yeah. So one area which is uh, some people have explored is the connection between the addressee agreement and honorificity. Okay. Right. So that's yeah. something which uh, uh, needs to be explore, uh, explore, uh, explored across the uh, spectrum for these languages which have addressee agreement. So that is one. Secondly, um, you know this um, honorificity is more and more uh, formally. Um, recognized um phi feature which is still within person feature but it is a formally recognized phi feature and there's lot of literature on that for example um a uh, work um, on this yeah a couple of uh, uh, references we have identified but not much available actually uh, in the syntax of honorification no i mean the japanese is one but there are yeah. others uh, areas where this has been worked and the kind of uh, honorificity things that you are uh, looking at um, i would suggest you can expand your net and look at uh, the languages of bihar and uh, try to figure out especially mathili i think and try to figure out the whole levels of 
honorificity and how that is syntactically because it has been figured out there's lots and lots of mphil phd dissertations from bhu where you will find this but then theoretically how do you figure it out yeah. you know what kind of five feature this is and how is it going to be right yeah uh, yeah how is it going to be that's primarily my concern here yeah so one area one way to incorporate would be through this uh, um, in you know that my 2016 paper the connection between this multiple agreement phenomena and this allocative agreement okay that's a thing that i kind of established and whether this uh, uh, you know if, if you think of it uh, you, if you think of the reason but there's a good reason to think of that you know address agreement is a, a honorific honorific phenomenon and agri uh, uh, an address agreement brings in this uh, one affix in the syntax so syntax is going to react in some way and this syntax reacts by sort of generalizing that and that was my slide about this new work about prakrit was already uh, receptive of this uh, Uh, establishing or sort of conforming the multiple agreement phenomena, and it needs to be established. But this is uh, clearly there's a connection between honorificity and multiple agreement phenomena. Okay, so I'll, I'll just explore that. Thank you, thank you. It's it's always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sir, the next question. I'll take the next question from our YouTube audience. So mm. the name uh, of the scholar is Purnendu Devnath, and he asks. Sir, is multiple agreement phenomena present in all Indo-Aryan languages? No. If you are uh, there for the whole duration of my talk, you'll realize that I picked only few languages, and these are the languages I call the CMP languages. And the CMP languages are the ones which are showing this. The other Indo-Aryan languages, well, Kashmiri is a case, okay, and that would be an interesting story because there was this. Uh, Uh, neolithic culture you know pre uh, sort of um, pre aryan neolithic culture there is archaeological evidence of that um, and that would be interesting to uh, explore that whether this proposal that i am giving whether that is also relates to kashmiri or not but the other indo aryan languages uh, will show it in not as a regular phenomenon thank you and sir our next question come from anu pande uh, from iit kanpur she ask is there no auxiliary in mara is there no yeah. auxiliary in mara i think jyoti has already answered that question in the chat box yes, yeah, there are <laughs> yes uh, and uh, now i'll take two comments from the youtube video binay uh, patnayak and professor renu renuka devi they really appreciate your lecture and they liked it a lot they have written it it has been very very informative And uh, the uh, is a comment. Or, uh, okay, yeah. There's one more question. Uh, as uh, like as the diachronic literature goes, the Magdan languages were split into two languages. And uh, he mentions one reference, Mount Tau, two thousand six, with object agreement in the past. Can this be the case that languages like Mathli never lost the object agreement, as seen in the Bangla, Assamese, or Odia? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, idea. and i had some things to say i have got the notes and all but i won't really talk about that um the uh, the uh, kind if you look at the inscriptions the nevari maithili inscriptions in uh, nepal uh, the uh, the ergativity was uh, already kind of gone by i mean uh, when you look at the inscription i only gave you a 17th or 18th century uh, text inscription but actually there are other earlier ones so one should really go back to 14th century inscriptions and look at the inscriptions because nobody has actually done it so there's lot to work on if you look at those inscriptions and look at the verb endings then you will be able to discover how um, by which you know century ergativity is already gone but this is certainly is a possible uh, plausible idea and i'll think more about this okay yeah thank you shayan uh, thank you sir and, uh, and i i think jyoti sharma from university of delhi she has raised her hand jyoti yeah. can you hear us please yeah hi sir hi hi everybody yeah uh, yeah i wanted to just raise uh, this topic we have discussed it uh, while we were working on our paper uh, regarding the splitics versus affixes Uh, I think this is a good forum to uh, have a discussion over it since Guru Jagan and Subbarao are also here. Uh, 
Uh, so there are quite a few diagnostics that have been suggested uh, to draw a distinction between critics and affixes. And uh, we have checked Mara against uh, most of these diagnostics. Um, but st sir, I still get confused, like how can one say that certain diagnostics are relevant and certain diagnostics are irrelevant or should be ignored while dealing with these kind of languages, like especially Munda and TV languages. Uh, I have seen uh, Aisha's work where uh, she uh, she has um, tested these diagnostics against Kantali, where she uh, where she has tested uh, Zuki and Palam's uh, diagnostics, but when we were working, uh, we like um, said that these are very English centric, or uh, so we didn't uh, emphasize on them. So yeah, just yes, small discussion over this, like this yeah. that will be helpful for uh, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a well known. So as you saw in the slides, only. Uh, two slides I had, or one slide I had, showing the difference between affixes and uh, clitics. So affixes and clitics, we had a, uh, actually, uh, Shailendra had organized a conference in 2017, and there were very, very interesting uh, papers, which are now published, I believe, uh, where we discussed this phenomena. But of course, again, it was not a syntax only uh, conference, so we didn't get to discuss the tests. And, Test, I know, Jyoti, you have done the, looked at the test and it's always a toss-up situation. And this also, I'll remind you, uh, others, that this is also the case with, let's say, um, let's say very famously, uh, um, um, famous South Asian trait that Subaru has discussed in his book uh, of experience as subjects, right? non-nominative subjects, okay? So uh, the, there are subject tests for those non-nominative subjects. But then also, even in Subaru's book mentioned, there are certain sub tests which show that they're not subjects, mm -hmm. okay? But so then it boils down to, and if you go through the literature, then it boils down to how many tests show that these are subject subjects, these non-nominative marked elements. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to me, headache is, mujhe sardard hai in Hindi Urdu, uh, or in Bangla, uh, amar matha dure che, uh, that is genitive and in Hindi Urdu and other languages you have dative. So uh, the test for subjecthood and the test for non-subjecthood actually compete quite well. And if, uh, that reminds me of a, like a, we should really look at optimality theory kind of constraint ranking here. Like which are the constraints or which are the tests which actually matter more for your overall uh, language. Okay, so then you have to establish that first. Then you say, well, in the uh, elements for in favoring subject, there are these two tests, which are like maha important, and therefore they score higher. Although non-subject uh, test I have found like five, and for subject I have found four tests. But then since because these two tests which work for subject, they are really important for the language, therefore this will weigh higher. Similarly, the critic affix discussion, I think, so there are, as you know, I mean, um, uh, as you know, Jyoti, um, addressing you, as you will know that in these both languages, like also uh, Munda languages and the uh, tibeto burman Igring languages, you can use both the uh, both the little clitic with the uh, verb and the full pronoun. Okay, uh, where both of them carry their own uh, meaning. It's not that. Uh, the affix becomes meaningless or the pronominal becomes meaningless. So they don't show actually clitic, clitic property there. They show affixal property. So, and you have done many more tests to sh show this. And we cannot actually uh, therefore use the test to say that this is clitic or this is um, affix. I think what we should do, the real test is actually the kind of theory you build. And you show that, well, cliticization naturally should require a different kind of theoretical explanation. Whereas affixation requires a different theoretical explanation. I think it's at the end of the day, the theoretical judgment will decide whether you consider this as clitics or affixes. Like in my talk, you saw, I uh, smartly sort of glossed over the detail because in the CMP languages from Bihar, they are affixes clearly. But in Munda and Tibetan Burman, they are in most of the times clearly clitics. So are you going to use the same theory? Most probably not. 
but again this also um, scores one point in favor of a mixed or morphosyntactic interpretation rather than a purely syntactic or purely morphological interpretation thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh, are there more questions i can't see a, any hand raised there was an okay in the chat okay yeah in chat yeah, there is yeah. hmm somebody said something no i think the, the, there's no relevant question for discussion uh, let me check this youtube uh, on youtube there are some uh, like uh, appreciations uh, for comments they like your lecture but there is no relevant questions uh, so uh, uh, uma ma'am uh, yes yeah so shall we proceed yes thank you thank you so much so thank you tanmay it was a thank wonderful you. i must say very enlightening and entertaining stories on agreement mm. off agreement on agreement you took us indeed into a very beautiful journey of this important phenomena in our languages especially from the himalayas to the northeast what uh, was interesting is to see the way you brought out the genealogically distinct groups closer together from an aerial perspective mm. and as well from the himalayas walking through different lanes i must say to the northeast of course i was expecting more examples from uh, kukichin and uh, other languages because even even though these are genealogically very distinct from the tibeto burman um, other uh, groups mm. of the languages i was very curious to see because agreement has a different uh, role in these languages especially with uh, so many other phenomenons like classifiers in in kukichin yeah so what was going on maybe for lack of time you did not cover it but it was very wonderful to listen to you thank you so much for taking time off from your schedule on behalf of the cil and on my own personal behalf i thank you first of all for accepting our invitation which was just pleasure you just did it by that because i know i can count on you as a friend and as a good colleague i too have a couple of questions the main thing was of course you looked into all these things it would be interesting to see the various types of agreement because to extend the talk maybe you may have a part 2 or part 3 somewhere so it's a wonderful base you had set up Mm. what are the other parameters when it comes to because when you look into walls just behind you on the screen as just because you are talking to let's say your mother you are going to have a different kind of agreement it's not about the mother you are talking about mohan whom you saw in uh, the market and that mohan may be a respectable person or maybe not a respectable person but then you are talking to addressing to a respectable person so i i think in tamil also you have something like that so there you have uh, your agreement pattern changes because of that but uh, yes i mean order verification on the sentence and i have taken care of that in my uh, 2016 paper where i have introduced something like speech act uh, head syntactic head for speech act within the sentential structure which sort of gets information from outside the sentence or beyond that sentence it gets information and therefore controls the kind of agreement that you see in the rest of the sentence so that speech act head was not something which is about the sentence but about the act of that's why i was saying uh, in response to uh, i think um, uh, who was that uh, yeah somebody asked right about the um, uh, honorificity yeah apurvas yeah so that um, the uh, the sim the similarity or the reason behind this kind of agreement could actually be honorificity right and one could be uh, and in you can actually semantically or speech situation wise you can understand not really purely semantic that if it's a speech act phenomena you are addressing you are addressing a sentence about anybody else but you are addressing to somebody and then that has an effect on actual grammatical forms 
And this is the idea I tried to capture saying that Prakrit gave you that freedom to let uh, uh, yourself out of the shackles of a very strict register because it was the also became the language of the common people and the masses. And therefore, that could be a driving force. There are like three, four things working together, uh, which could be a driving force for this kind of agreement phenomenon. Last question from my side before I thank you again. Yeah. So, how many languages were in your sample for this kind of uh, analysis? Well, uh, 378 from walls, <laughs> but that is just a uh, map. <laughs> no, no, I looked at, so it's a series of work that I've done for over several, several years. So I've looked at four languages in uh, uh, that CMP languages, the languages of Bihar. I've seen Bihar and Jharkhand because Kurmali is also there. I looked at four languages there. Then I looked at Santali and Mundari uh, from the Jharkhand area. Then I have been looking at this, uh, some of the Kiranti languages and that's a joint work with uh, Jyoti. And she has been looking at many more Kiranti languages. And we're looking at some of the more Kukichin, not just Mara, but also Mizo, which has been worked on to some extent, but not from a theoretical point of view. So it's uh, not a great sample because, you know, our work focus is trying to figure out a theoretical explanation. So we're not uh, spreading our net too wide to get like 100 languages because once we find it into three languages of the same region, we sort of extrapolate saying, okay, this is a phenomenon that we need to explore further. Yeah, and it would be interesting to see it from aerial perspective. Yes. Like yes. Into more yes. and more. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think I think Pankaj had read that out in my bio that for the last few years my idea is that this is a Sprachbund. It's a linguistic area. This east and little bit of the northeast is a linguistic area with sort of linguistic area, but with one feature only. I'm looking at multiple agreement. I'm not looking at phonology features, phon phonetic features, and morphological other features. But this. So this is a new kind of idea. Yeah. Anyway, lovely to hear you as always, Tanmay. Thank you once again on behalf of our institute and on everyone's behalf who is present here. Thank you so much Thank for you. being and enlightening us. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. okay. Bye bye. I I take I would like to thank everyone present here. And anything else from Tanmay? So that could be the last one before we say bye. Yeah, I would say, I would like to say that uh, uh, um, typological work is important, but if you have a little bit of informed typology, so if you have some basic ideas of the structure, then I think it reveals a different world together to you, altogether, you know, different world. And you can actually explore many more pathways. So I would say a uh, bit uh, information about the structural phenomena is important for establishing a solid kind of typological phenomena. Okay, so thank you for the concluding remark. I once again thank all of you and I thank Pankaj Divedi for wonderfully moderating this session. Thank and you. for all of you for your patience from 11 till, uh, some of you were there from 11.15, so okay. for two hours. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice Friday. We have an Ashara Friday here in Mysore, which okay. is auspicious. So okay. Wish you best of luck and let everything be nice for the world in terms of uh, non COVID situations yeah. and other things. Yeah. yeah. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye.